recording yet. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Eugene. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, great. Good to be great. here. Great. Yeah. Um, we did a, a podcast. Gosh, it seemed like it must have been a couple of months ago. We did a podcast, which is uh, uploaded on the Natural Women's Council. And that one was called the, the Transgender Agenda, the War on Our Children. And we talked about sort of where some of this stuff is coming from, because parents haven't asked for it, schools haven't asked for it, where is it coming from? So following the last podcast and following a request from many parents, teachers, principles, um, we, Eugene has done a very deep dive into where this is coming from because it's questions people have asked us um, in the groups where we work with uh, myself from the Natural Women's Council. We, we work with Parents Rights Alliance, Irish Education Alliance and Lawyers for Justice Ireland. And questions have been coming through all of our channels to all of our different groups on where is this coming from? So tonight we are doing an expose on where this is coming from. We have so many facts, so much data, uh, just a viewer warning that this probably is not a child-friendly video is that true to say and also another that, that's correct uh, yeah yeah and another warning is there uh, are some things in here that really will alarm parents eugene has been doing some live sessions around ireland and the overarching feeling from parents is that of very much alarm and concern so just be prepared to hear some information that will be very alarming and concerning but it's better to really know where this is coming from so we have the sort of the, the power to push back on it with our with our own uh, schools and and be aware of what's happening so eugene has a lot of slides as well to share so you can uh, go ahead and uh, kick off and I'll, I'll brace myself for this information yeah, yeah, just give me a minute here. So, and I'll talk about, um, let's get this up. Are we seeing that okay? We can, and I'll jump in, Eugene, because I know I've had a very high level viewing of the slides, but as you get talking, uh, if you don't mind, I might jump yep. in and ask some, some questions as well. Uh, absolutely fine. So what we're gonna cover is, is a kind of an introduction to gender identity and queer theory. And uh, let's go through our agenda. I think a lot of people credit John Money with gender identity and it and it is relevant to John Money. So we will spend a few minutes at the start just talking about the John Money story and you know where gender identity appeared from him because he did bring it into the public consciousness. So we need to talk about that. But he isn't the origin of gender identity. And he, and it's certainly his definition of it wouldn't be what is the definition as we have today, which comes from queer theory. We'll talk about the origins of queer theory. So we're really going to deep, dig deep there in terms of the history. And then we're going to roll that. We're going to go right back in time and then we're going to roll it forward to the current day and the definition of queer theory as it is today. And queer theory was only really probably defined in the kind of uh, early 90s. And that's the kind of what we'll talk about, the definition of it from there. And then we'll talk a little bit about queer theory in schools. Um, and uh, it's, it's, this is not going to be a full session on that today, but to kind of give you an idea of how queer theory is in our schools now, uh, why it's in our schools and how it's it is in our schools. So we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. OK, so let's get started with John Money. So I have question mark here, the origins of gender identity, question mark, John Money. And that's because, as I said, he really wasn't the originator but he is strongly associated with it. Um, so he was an American psychologist, sexologist, working in the John, Johns Hopkins uh, University, working in the area of sexual uh, behavior, human sexual behavior. And he had a belief that gender identity, as he understood it, which was more in a binary sense, like as in boy or girl, uh, was malleable. And it if you actually changed it in the first couple of years of life, uh, this was his hypothesis, that you could raise a boy as a girl or a girl as a boy. Um, and he also advocated for uh, the surgical normalization as part of inter intersex conditions. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So he defined gender identity in 1973. This is his definition of it, um, uh, which I think people could kind of relate to. And again, it was more in the context of a binary. Uh, so he wasn't talking about, you know, a spectrum of genders or anything like that. So I won't, I won't talk through that, uh, but we, you know, we and we will have links as well. I think that's the other thing, Anna. So most of this material, source material, a lot of it is online. So we will have links to it, so people could get to the source material uh, and take a look at it. Or some of them are books as well. So we'll make references to the books where it's applicable. 
So gender identity actually did appear long before this. So 10 years earlier, the term was actually used in a medical context uh, at a, at a, as part of a conference, as one of the papers at a conference 10 years earlier. So he wasn't even the first person to use the term. And as we see, the notion of gender identity actually goes back even further when we start talking about queer theory. So we'll see it there. But I guess the important thing is that John Money did get a lot of publicity, and we'll talk about that next in, in what context. So the big thing here was his big experiment was with the Rhymer twins and uh, David and Brian. And these two uh, two twins, uh, born in 1965, unfortunately, David, uh, during a circumcision operation, his penis was damaged, irreparably damaged. And so the parents were, you know, really in an awful state. They heard about John Money. They went to John Money. He advised that they medically transition David. So David became Brenda uh, and and that they raise uh, David as a girl and that and and that it that should be okay. So that became his experiment, so to speak. And he he talked about this in his book in 1972. Um, and he got an awful lot of publicity. This was all over the place. So this guy really made a great living out of this for about 20 years, I guess. Um, and he talked about how successful it was and, and how the whole notion of nurture over nature, which was kind of the, the term that was used, uh, was successful and that this was proving his hypothesis. However, that wasn't the truth. Um, uh, Brenda was deeply disturbed, uh, didn't fit in, uh, was described as a, as a cave girl by other girls in the school. Uh, it, you know, it, as a girl, Brenda was never happy. And so eventually the parents told Brenda that, Brenda, you're actually David, you were born a boy. And so he chose to revert to his 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 birth sex at that point in time and did undergo some more surgical procedures as part of that. He did get married, adopted three children. So, and, and you know, David had got a bit of peace now in his life as he had 14 years of turmoil. Um, despite that pain and turmoil, uh, it, money continued to report that this was a success. And as I said, he made a lot of capital out of that from a career perspective. And, um, you know, he used this as a kind of a use case. Uh, and, and everybody believed that this was absolutely fine. So for a very long period of time in the world of medicine, this was seen as a success and this was seen as something you could do. Unfortunately, the two the two uh, twins both took their own lives. Uh, Brian in 2002 and David shot himself in 2004. And we'll see the reason for that on the next slide, because both kids were, were actually quite disturbed. Um, I'll jump in, Eugene, and, and say that uh, if I yeah. can just jump in. And I, I actually, well yeah. before I moved to Ireland, 20, about 20 years ago, a friend re recommended a book to me. I was just Googling it because I couldn't remember the name. But there's a book called As Nature Made Him. And I read that book before I even knew anything about yeah. this transgender agenda. And it was a very heartbreaking book called As Nature Made Him. And it's uh, it's available on uh, many bookshops for about, you know, eight or 10 euros. Very sad book. But I, I did read that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, it, it, it's haunting. Every, when I look at the photographs here, here as well, yeah. I, I just it's so sad. It's such a sad mm -hmm. story. So, you know, essentially, uh, the case did go public and it was made public. And so it did come out and We'll have a link to a, a, an article, I think, from the Irish Independent, even talking about this at the time when it did. But it came very late. So um, and it did transpire as well that he had been abusing the two twins. They used to come on regular visits to uh, to his office, John Money. And in the office, he would basically get the two killed. Now, they were a boy and a girl, if you want to call it that way at the time. So he got them to actually act out kind of sexual acts uh, together and to touch each other, etc., and he talked about this as being a childhood rehearsal play, you know, as part of developing their gender identity. So this was abuse, obviously. And uh, so these poor, poor uh, children were abused, basically, by, by John Money. And John Money himself was actually quite a troubled individual. And, and I think it is believed that he was abused by his own parents or by his father. Um, the trouble is, uh, by the time that this was discovered, the whole notion of a, sex a socially constructed gender identity had been out there for 20 years. Uh, as a success, as something that you could do. And also this, the, his intersex policy in terms of normalization was also out there, which again, uh, and we'll talk about that soon, uh, it was, was not really necessarily appropriate and has been superseded. He had done the damage. 
the damage was done. So while he didn't invent gender identity and and ultimately the definition of it morphed over time and is different today, he did bring this into the public consciousness. It did get out there. So let's talk about Sophie Ottaway. So Sophie, Sophie Ottaway is kind of an example of somebody who was, I suppose, an indirect victim of John Money. Uh, born with an intersex condition in 1986. And at that point in time, John Money's guidance was still being used uh, in the medical profession. And so uh, one of the issues that Sophie had, was born a boy, had a, a white chromosome, had testes, but had a micro penis. And um, John Money's guidance would be that you basically uh, transition somebody in that state to a girl. So uh, Sophie or, it never had a boy's name. So there was no, there's no boy's name for Sophie who's always been a girl. Uh, was transitioned as a as an infant. Um, she un she underwent that transition, and you know they when she got to puberty, they basically told her that her ovaries were removed, and she needed to go on hormone replacement therapy, which obviously wasn't true because she never had ovaries. And by accident, she discovered as a teenager, she saw the screen on her doctor's in her doctor's surgery that she was actually a boy, and it was frightful, and she she. Found that out. Uh, obviously, she brought. Up, she wasn't happy with her parents. Um, she wasn't happy with the decision that was made. She had lost her fertility. Uh, couldn't have. Couldn't have, have children, and would have liked to have been a parent. Um, now, Sophie chose not to detransit because you know she she said, "I just don't want to go to the doctors again." She was, you know, she didn't trust them anymore. They had failed her as a child. So, Sophie is still Sophie. Uh, has maintained her, her ident identity as as a, a girl. Um, and today she kind of advocates for the whole notion of informed consent uh, in terms of transgender medicine so that people should only be making the decision regarding transition if they're old enough and of a sound mind enough to make that decision. That's And that's what she's advocating for. Very sad story. Very nice person. If you search for Sophie Ottaway on YouTube, you'll get her videos. She's on a few videos. She talks about her experience. And uh, it's again, it's quite sad. But the good thing is she's got a very positive outlook about it and, you know, seems to be managing well. And, and she's just happy now to give her support to uh, people who might be in a similar situation. So and Eugene, so I think the, it's really important was, if I can cut in for yeah. a second. I think it's really yeah. important for people to hear the stories of the Reimer twins and hear the story you shared of Sophie and hear these people speaking and and appreciate what happened, because I foresee that in Ireland, or really it's a global a global thing, is if all of these parents now start giving their children the puberty blockers, the cross-sex hormones, giving them all these surgeries, when the child is still developing physically, emotionally, mentally, when that child grows up in their late teens or 20s, we've seen many stories of the people detransitioning, they will have a serious resentment to their parents for doing something to them as a child that they could not and were not old enough to, cons to consent to. And I believe this will be one of Ireland's biggest child abuse scandals that we've ever seen in this country down the line in a decade when this really, really becomes, uh, you know, even more of a social contagion. Yeah. 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 And, and I think we've seen that with the, I mean, the W path, Mm -hmm. files have been revealed today and i think yes. we're seeing that in some of those videos uh mm -hmm. we, this, we see the doctors talking about exactly what you're talking about uh, that people were perhaps not in a position to make the consent at the time uh, not in a state to do it yep so so this is it so uh, so john money he didn't invent the term gender identity however he did bring it into the public consciousness both medical and society uh and it has been replaced and we'll talk about it in the context of gen uh, queer theory later on uh, he he hypothesized that nurture could trump nature. Um, and I think, you know, that experiment just went terribly wrong, unfortunately. Um, and he did influence the treatment path for intersex for so many years, which was kind of a one size fits all normalization uh, strategy. It took no consideration of preserving fertility or the impact of, of, of hormone replacement or, you know, cross sex hormones. Again, two practices that really, you know, were uh, were crazy from a medical perspective. So, you know, this man has his legacy, unfortunately, is extremely tainted. Uh, he was a very troubled man. Very sad stories. Uh, but he did get this this term of gender identity out into the public consciousness, um, uh, you know, in the second half of, of the last century. So he did achieve in doing that, albeit not in the same context as we talk about it today. OK, so. Um, 
now we go on to the next section. So we're going to talk about the origins of uh, queer theory. And first of all, we have to talk about critical theory. So you, we're going into a history lesson now. So the next slide is going to be extremely surprising. Uh, well, actually, before we get into it, just to, to talk about the term queer. Uh, so I grew up at, at a time when you would have talked about having a queer uncle who was gay, for example, or you might have had a queer friend at school or whatever. It was, it was a, a pejorative term used for gay people, usually male. Uh, but that meaning has changed. And uh, the meaning we're going to talk about in the context of this presentation is a, a, a different, different meaning. It's a political and ideological meaning. And we'll see that as we get into it. Uh, now, gay and lesbian people still identify as queer today. They're just, they're, but they may not identify from the political aspect. I think that's really important. So there's there's a differentiation here. And, you know, there are people to be, to identify as queer in the new way that you identify as queer, you, you could be heterosexual. You, uh, you don't have to even have a queer identity to be identifying as queer. It, you're basically taking on the ide ideology, the belief system, um, the politics of queer, and uh, you're an advocate for that. So you could have two parents who could be queer, they could have children. Um, that's, you know, you don't have to be gay to be queer, basically. And if you're gay, it doesn't mean you're queer. Uh, that's really, really important. So but just uh, to confirm, these are two context. separate, two separate things, then there's there's gay, there's queer, and the two are completely uh, separate. It's it's they're isolated. Yeah. One doesn't yeah. rely on the other. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. was that was new to me uh, as no. I've been down this journey, journey learning more. So thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, no. So uh, you may wonder why have I got a slide up, which uh, this is from a website, uh, Marxist.org. Uh, it's a Marxist uh, website and uh, they've got an archive of Marxist material. So you've got the writings of Karl Marx actually on this website. And you'll also get this uh, talking about the Frankfurt School. So we need to talk about the Frankfurt School. So uh, in the mid in the 20s, the early 20s, um, Marxists, intellectual Marxists, which is the people we're talking about here, were very disappointed that there hadn't been a Marxist revolution across Europe and across the Western world. And they started to see that the, the old form of revolution where you would get the, the, the work, the proletariat, the working class rising up and seizing the means of production uh, as in industrial production, that just wasn't going to happen. They saw that wasn't going to happen anymore. And they saw that they needed to have an alternative approach. And that alternative approach was by seizing cultural production and seizing education. Um, so they started this thing called uh, uh, the Frankfurt School. It was uh, uh, the Institute for Social Research it was started in Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, it was originally called the Institute for Marxism. Uh, but they kind of renamed it. That was kind of a very uh, obvious name. So they didn't want to be, they wanted to be a bit more subtle about it. So they called it the Institute uh, uh, for Social Research. And this was a group of philosophers, sociologists and psychologists. Um, and basically they started developing uh, what we now know as critical theory. And the, the notion behind critical theory uh, was basically to dismantle a society uh, as part of a cultural revolution. So you would, they, and they seek to dismantle Western society. That was their intention. Uh, so critical theory basically, and it has a lot of sub theories. Uh, it, it basically means you look at everything from a Marxist, critical Marxist lens. You deconstruct everything, you criticize, everything becomes oppressive and you you, you tear apart basically the society with a view to replacing it uh, with, uh, you know, a new society, uh, with a new belief system, etc. That was kind of the, the whole thing. So um, you can see the kind of um, word chart there with critical theory. And you'll probably recognize an awful lot of the words that sit around mm -hmm. it, like racism, oppression, microaggression, patriarchy, the whole thing, white privilege. These are terms that we use today. We see these today. And uh, these would all have been coming out of critical theory, out of critical race theory, which is a form of critical theory, uh, uh, and the whole area of critical social justice. So critical social justice, uh, as we know it today, is typically what people refer to as woke. Um, so the Frankfurt School, they recognize this failure of classic Marxism. Uh, you could call these cultural Marxists, that's what they're, or neo-Marxists, these are the kind of terms that would be used. 
So they wanted to look at means of cultural and educational, seizing the means of cultural and education production. That's what they're all about. Uh, so they looked at things like gender studies, cultural studies, and critical theory in general. Um, and these, these ultimately contributed to the emergence of queer theory. Uh, and we'll see where that comes from. Frankfurt School, they, they were basically social critique. So they were criticizing Western culture, Western society, tearing it down, basically. And I think we can see this today. I think mm -hmm. you can we can see the effects of this today. So these guys, this was 100 years ago. And basically, the genesis of their ideas we're seeing in action today. Uh, they looked at ideology. They looked at power dynamics. They looked at how institutions worked. They looked at... Uh, uh, all those relationships um, across um, society. So very and, interesting, uh, Eugene. Said, if I can, out. if I can just yeah. cut in, looking at the words on the bottom yeah. left here of the screen, many of those words are in the school textbooks that I have uh, in my press here at home, such as the. Uh, I know that uh, Norma Foley's talked about the critical race theory coming in about the white privilege. A lot of uh, there's a social justice um, in the textbooks, things like BLM, LGBT, climate. So. And the LGBT has obviously made it uh, very much into schools as we see all of the, the transgender and pride flags waving outside many schools. So looking at this, it's interesting that a lot of those words are in the textbooks already in our schools. Yeah. Now, they didn't have all those words in, in the 1920s. Some of those words have mm -hmm. come in the last 10, 20 years, yeah. but they've come from critical theory. That's the key. This is their origin. This is the genesis of woke, this is the genesis of what we see today in our schools, what's being taught in our schools. And it's ultimately the genesis of queer theory, which we're gonna get into in more detail. And you can see it there, questioning normativity, um, critically examining cultural and societal structures, sexuality and gender, looking at those in different ways. It, this, is, this is the start, right? So how did it evolve? So essentially what happened in the 30s we had the whole rise of Nazism, uh, fascism in Germany, and the, the members of the, the Frankfurt School, a lot of them were Jewish, Marxists. Uh, Germany was not a place to be at that point in time. So they decided to leave and they moved to the United States. Now, they were, there was a lot of Marxists and communists in the United States. They welcomed them with open arms. So they set up the Institute for Social Research in Columbia University. Um, and... They basically went practicing and uh, they, they were lecturing, they were uh, doing their research, writing their books uh, in the US uh, over the whole period of the war. And they, as I describe it here, they injected their poison of critical uh, theory into uh, the, the US academic system, into the university system. And from that, from there, it found its way into ultimately into the schools. This is how that got there. It, it was These guys had to go over there during the war. They brought this with them and they basically brought uh, this into academia in the US. They brought uh, uh, critical theory. So and this so is not this, the these theories. So Herbert, uh, these theories, Eugene, then back to the, you know, the social justice things and the the uh, LGBTQ. A lot of people in the public think it's a bottom up, all about being diverse and inclusivity and DNI and all that. But actually, seeing this, it's coming from the from the very top down, isn't it? Yeah, it's politics. Yeah. The point is, it's politics, right? It's mm -hmm. Marxism. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you can call it all you like, but that's ultimately where it's come from, and it's coming through academia. So, the, and and it's all they also looked at cultural production. So it, they also looked at getting into how can they get into the media, how they can they get into television as that emerged, uh, you know, in the middle of the last century, into uh, the, the production of newspapers, magazines, the social the sources of social production. They sought to get into those agencies and take them over, basically. That was the, the, the nub of this. So this is Herbert Marcuse, his picture is here, his book uh, is one of his major textbooks, Eros and Civilization. Um, you know, this has actually been used, it fed into the gay liberation movement. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the various concepts uh, that he developed in this book. And here are some of the quotations from his Marxism and New Humanity, uh, Unfinished Revolution. A different, he, he talks about the, the creation of a different type of human being, uh, a new consciousness, 
uh, a new language, you know, redefining language and a new set of values, uh, basically a new morality. And we would know that today as woke morality. Um, so these things were emerging uh, during this time. So this is 1970, right? So this is time has moved on here. These coming into 1969, 1970. Uh, so these guys were having a, a growing influence and that, that influence has continued to this day. But these guys are still being cited. People are still following critical theories. They've evolved them. Uh, but they're here with us today um, in, in the 21st century. So this is the lasting legacy of the Frankfurt School. And it's impacted everything. It's influenced uh, scholars in academia. And as I said, it ultimately started has Im impacted education. And we'll talk about that. All right. So now we need to get into queer theory. So uh, we're going to this. Uh, this lady was a, a, an, a, a philosopher, I suppose, writer. She was a Marxist as well, um, Simone de Beauvoir. And she was kind of she has been credited as being one of the, the kind of foundation stones of queer theory uh, and in, introducing this notion uh, between sex and gender. So her book in 1949, The Second Sex, this is where this comes out. This is the genesis, I guess, of. Uh, the fact that, you know, saying that man and woman are socially constructed, right? The notion of man and woman. 1949, right? It's This is a long time ago. Um, and uh, so, you know, she talks, one of her, her classic statements that often quoted is that uh, one is not born, but becomes a woman. Um, and so she says, you know, being female did not make one a woman. So the reference is there if you want to read this book. Um, this is kind of a genesis of queer theory coming through here. She was a Marxist, so obviously she's building on those Marxist themes are coming out in her writing. Um, uh, but you can see where, you know, she's focused, obviously, on sex and gender. That's kind of her focus. She's not as focused on some of the other aspects of critical theory. Uh, so that, that that's uh, uh, Simon de Beauvoir. And then the, I would describe this man as probably the, the grandfather of queer theory. Uh, Michel Foucault, a postmodernist, an activist, um, uh, and very much into the whole area of sexuality uh, and, you know, opening up sexuality and identity uh, and ex exploring the, the power structures around uh, uh, sexuality. He's a postmodernist, so he doesn't believe in the truth. He doesn't believe in objective truth. He believes that truth is determined by power. So whoever is in power determines what the truth is. He's dead now. So everybody dies. So I'm sorry, uh, Michel, you, the truth is that people die. So whether you like it or not, um, that's what happens. So unfortunately, this is a postmodernist construct, this uh, notion of the truth, relative truth, my truth, your truth, that there is no objective truth. And hence, there's a rejection of science and biology and mathematics and any of the, 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 the hard sciences, anything that, that, that is based actually on factual material. This guy probably disagreed with gravity that it didn't exist. This is a huge problem. And I think it's a common problem across all the people that are the founding fathers of, of critical theory and queer theory. They're all sociologists. They're all philosophers. Uh, sexologists, gender theorists. These are not medical people. These are not scientists. This is not based on research. This is not based on fact that you can actually go and research and facts. And all these are theories. These are people coming up with theories of how things are, not how they are. People believe that this is be, this is absolute truth. So this is dangerous, right? This whole, this postmodernist relative morality. And you, Eugene, I know is very, um, very dangerous. If I can <laughs> jump in, uh, uh, that's maybe po possibly a reason that um, a lot of the core subjects in the school curriculum for secondary school, science being one, has moved from core to optional because science is very much factual. It's biology. It's it's you're male, you're female. We have the sun, the moon, life and death that's being moved into optional and that would align with the likes of this queer theory to say that it's all more philosophy versus biology. Would that maybe align with some of the reasons those core subjects have been moved out? Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is to give more time uh, for uh, 
covering critical theory and critical mm -hmm. pedagogy and that's we'll cover that in another session so <laughs> it's 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 two things it's 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 a de-emphasis obviously of those but it's also giving more time for essentially political indoctrination if i call it that yeah that's essentially what it, it what it's giving time for it's it's giving time to create a critical conscious which is which mm -hmm. is woke right um <clears throat> so this guy um you know, he's, he's he wouldn't be my type of person. I'm an engineer. I deal in hard facts. If things don't work, uh, people die uh, and you have accidents and stuff like that. Uh, I can't live by not having a truth, unfortunately. And most people can't either. So I am i don't really have a lot of time for people like this. Um, he again, he challenged the whole essentialist view of sexuality. Uh, so, again, you can see that and that's been picked up by queer theory. Uh, he was very much into uh, diverse um sexual practices bdsm for example uh he would have been an advocate for he was an advocate for reducing the age of consent uh for sex with uh, with minors um and there was a kind of a postmodernist movement around that at the time so um it, you know this is michel foucault uh he is cited heavily in queer theory circles uh so people really do love michel foucault i mean he is uh He's revered uh, from a queer theory perspective. So speaking against him, you know, won't be too popular. Um, so I said this whole notion of resisting heteronormativity and uh, the whole notion of power. These people are all into this power dynamic. They're all into the oppressor oppressed power dynamic, which obviously feeds into Marxism. Um, that's always a theme with them. Um, so let's move on. So coming closer to the current day, we've got Judith Butler and her 1990 book, Gender Trouble. Uh, feminism subversion of identity. So Judah Butler is very much around the whole notion of gender being performative. If you you perform your gender, um, it's nothing to do with your biology. It's how you perform. And uh, in this way, she was obviously you know destabilizing the notion of gender and sex as, as we would would traditionally look on it. Um, and that, you know, there's no natural sex. So again, she would be denying biology. She would be basically saying, you know, the fact that you're male or female from a a, a sexual biological perspective means nothing. Uh, your gender is different to that. So this is a, a construct of queer theory. So we can see this here. We can see this coming for, directly from from her, but it's obviously evolved. So this is not not new. Uh, we we saw the people in the Frankfurt School talking about questioning gender and normativity. So. Uh, she's kind of just evolving it. She talks about drag performance as a form of subversion. You know, the the man in a dress, the woman with a beard kind of constructs, uh, you know, uh, gender bending is the term people would have used years ago. Um, and then, you know, perform, performative nature of gender identity. Um, so Gail Rubin. So Gail Rubin comes at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, she feels she kind of follows along the kind of sexual practice aspects of of uh, Michel Foucault, I suppose, the whole, uh, and she has this thing, this uh, thinking sex notes uh, for a radical theory of sex and politics. So these are quotations from that document or from that paper. She talks about boy lovers. Um, so what's a boy lover? So a boy lover is usually a man who wants to have sex with boys, um, underage boys, that is. So that would be, so, this um, is really normalizing, and, you know, uh, would this be like a sex with children? This is sort of normalizing pedophilia, really. For, they wouldn't call it pedophilia, but they believe it's sex uh, with that, children. That, 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 well, that, that, yeah. Yeah, she, she's kind of saying, what's the problem? She's kind of saying, what's the problem with child porn? She's, you know, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, have radical theory, theory of sex and, and, and uh, identity denouncing erotic injustice. So people who are scorning certain sexual practices you know she has an issue with that it's basically uh you know she wants this whole notion of uh, destigmatization normalization of of sexual practices which today we, we would not think as normal so she created this thing called the uh, she has this thing called the charm circle and it's got an inner circle and an outer circle and uh, now for people uh, you can get this online. So if you do a search for the charm circle, um, uh, the the Gail Rubin charm charm circle, you'll get the pictures online of this, so you can read it. The inner circle there is the kind of normative circle, if I call it that. 
it's you know uh, sex within a, a a a gender binary people married monog monogamous sex uh, etc the outer circle is sex with multiple people uh, sex with objects uh, in different places etc etc okay it's basically it's it's queering basically it's 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 kind of queering sexuality uh and and you know she so she would be basically saying that right now these other sexual practices were being repressed sexually repressed people are looking down on these things they're condemning these other sexual practices that's bad we need to fight against that we need to say that all of these things are fine and good and we should be uh we should be uh supporting them i guess in in the context of adults uh, between consenting adults um at the end of the day it's up to themselves but that's but bringing this into a classroom is the issue. This is being brought into the classroom as part of queer theory, as part of SPHE. That's the problem for parents. So this isn't between consenting adults. This is part of the curriculum for SPHE now. It's very you interesting, it Eugene. A lot of the things yeah. I'm looking at on the outer limit circle, which you said everybody can Google and, and look up, it's real. A lot of the things on the outer limit circle were the same fetishes we were finding in books at the library in the age 12 section so that's very interesting yep. that all of this outer limit was already being pushed in the libraries and dismissed by the guard of the children's ombudsman children's books ireland libraries ireland county councils and more that outer limit was being allowed in front of children in our public libraries and everybody turned a blind eye except the concerned parents of course yeah and the reason for that is because it's queer theory, and if you're a Marxist, you agree with it. Which means if you're part of a trade union, a lot of people in trade unions would be self-declared Marxists. They would support this. They wouldn't have a problem with it. That's the that's the scary thought, right? So let's move on. Uh, so um, Saint Foucault, Saint Foucault. So this is a uh, David Halpern produced this book, um, 1995. A book and it, it, it's about um, towards a gay hagiography uh, so people might wonder what that is if you see the definition down below it's a biography that treats its subject with undue reverence so David Halpern is basically celebrating Michel Foucault here he's calling him Saint, Fou Saint Foucault so and this is a direct quote from the book so this is very important because this is a kind of a definition of queer and if I just talk about the so important, the first part of it here, he is distinguishing between gay. So we did this at the very start. We basically and he's doing it as well. He's basically saying, unlike a gay identity. So this is separate to a gay identity. That's really important. And we've we've talked about that already. So he says a queer identity need not be grounded in any positive truth or in any stable reality. Now, that's kind of scary if you're going to start teaching something like that to children. And then I continue. This is again quoting from him. As the very word implies, queer does not uh, name some natural kind or refer to some uh, determinate object. It acquires its meaning from its oppositional position to the norm. Queer is by definition whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. It's an identity without an essence. That's it. That line there, the red piece. That's the definition of queer. If you want to take one takeaway from this whole presentation, it's in opposition to the norm. It wishes to subvert the norm and replace the norm. Okay. And that goes, just to so, clarify, Eugene, that goes against the norm. So whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, this is different. This is going against both. This is going against the norm, against correct. anything grounded in truth or stable reality. Correct. Because homosexuality today is the norm. It's cisgender. It's norm. It, it, it's it, they consider it's considered a norm. So you have to queer homosexuality in the same way as you queer heteronormativity. And we'll talk about those terms. We'll get into those terms in a little while. So this is just to, to kind of tee up what we're going to get into here. So you can read this book. It, it I'll tell you uh, health warning if you want to read this book. But if you do want to find out a bit more about queer theory, this is a text, a very definitive text that you could read, and it's a hard read. Um, uh, there's a whole section on anal yoga in this book. Um, I'm not going to say any more, right? So you've been warned. Um, 
Okay, let's move on. Um, so these are this is where you know queer theory breaking it down a little bit more into I suppose the different elements of queer theory. So destruction of categories, you know, the the, the destruction of sex and gender as we know it today, bringing in the whole notion of fluidity, uh, rejection of essentialism. That's rejection of biology uh, as as we know it today. Uh, and saying that I, your identity, you know, is, is socially constructed and performative. And again, these are concepts, as we saw, that were being developed, you know, long before this. And then the critique of norms, uh, in, in particular with regard to normative sexual practices, as we saw from Gail Rubin. So this is the kind of spine of critical theory, and it's supported by these other things. Um, yeah, you'll see the kind of some of the language here would be kind of familiar. Um, um, you know, in terms of inclusivity and diversity, where we see that before, mm -hmm. um, intersectionality. So you inter, so you you combine this with race, for example, uh, a queer black person, a queer you know person of color, uh, uh, and then bring it into bring feminist theory into it as well. So you get this notion of intersectionality, language and representation. So changing the meaning of language. Um, and changing the usage of language. So this whole concept of getting rid of gendered language, heteronormative language with, that we see in, the, in society today, right? So this is, so language is really important to these people and um, and is used as a weapon sometimes, it's weaponized. And then this whole focus on power dynamics and, um, you know, this is really about, you know, how you can, play out, you know, be able to take control of, of societies and organizations. And they've really figured out how to do that. Uh, and that's a topic for another day. Um, and how you can influence government, how you can influence uh, regulation, etc. So queer anthropology, let's move on. So we're, I think a lot of people would have seen the, <laughs> the gender bred person. Uh, this is the gender unicorn, which is commonly used in lectures on queer theory. And you can see this separates out your gender identity, your gender expression, your sex assigned at birth, um, and then who you're attracted to, who you're emotionally attracted to. So it's kind of creating this other world of, of you know, anthropology. It's a new form of anthropology, basically. So your nature and your identity is independent of your biological sex. It's not binary. It's a, it's a spectrum, similarly for your gender expression. And the gender is performative you know that's kind of old. it's not based on your uh, uh, what you were born as and it can also be fluid could change over time and where is this gender so, unicorn yeah. used is this already used in academia uh it's it is used in academia you'll see this in university lectures on queer theory and we have a we'll give we'll give a reference to a university lecture that actually uses it so we, okay. people can we'll put that in the in the in the description section so people can check that out Interesting uh, so you, how you, it's you, interesting, Eugene, how they always choose the, you know, the rainbows and the unicorns and the mermaids and all these lovely things that really attract uh, the the young ones, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is aimed at children and can be used in schools as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure you see this popping up. So your body is merely a vessel. The sex has no bearing on your gender identity, and of course that means then that. If there's a mismatch with your gender identity and your body, then you're trans. You've been born in the wrong body, and you're you're trans, as we know. So this, I think, we're, most people would be familiar with with this construct now at this point in time. So this is the ideological construct of gender. So when Dr. Donald O'Shea was talking about uh, ideology versus you know his uh, pathology, his medical practice, this is what he was referring to. So if you have this belief system. You take a very different view to the transitioning of a child and how you actually deal with that. You would be very much on the affirmative care model. Uh, you'll be socially transitioning them right away. You'll be giving them the new name and pronouns, and you'll be following that medical path, medicalized pathway, without question, without question. So, this is this is where that comes from. So, I think if you understand this, then you'll understand where that mindset comes from. Um. So let's let's move on. So this is more more detail, a bit more detail in terms of the definition of of gender first. You know the performative. Um, uh, you know it's a it, it it's a, you know this whole behaviors. You know the challenging the binary. Uh, it's not strictly male and female. It's more of a of a uh, as I say more of a spectrum. 
it's not biologically determined um and then your identity then which is the other side of it um uh, your deeply felt internal sense of what your gender actually is and of course if it's aligned you're cisgender if you're not aligned you're trans uh they're the kind of the main the main concepts there and of course this whole range of diverse gender identities we know all the various you know demi boy demi girl you know all the pansexual we know all these terms you know these are the, the various terms that people use so there's a whole range of gender identities people can have uh and to say again it's not solely determined by biology um and you know just even the behaviors are there's not a fixed set, set of behaviors so anything that was normal or or what we would have considered as a normal view of a male and female woman and man uh that's broken apart here that's queered uh you you know that's challenged and 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 is not accepted you you, you basically you have to set, accept you know the new world which is you know gender is fluid etc uh and biology is rejected basically so this would be, uh, Eugene, it appears to be that this would be sort of looking at this slide sort of anti-gay. So if I'm a feminine boy or a masculine girl, this would yeah. say you are that you're in the wrong body and they would try to to trans. You hear the expression trans the gay away that that would fall under this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it falls under it, it. It does run into trouble. So the the. Uh, the whole notion of same-sex attraction is a problem, actually, for queer theory, because uh, just as you said there, that, that, you know, a gay boy might appear that he's behaving maybe in a feminine way or something like that. And then, oh, hence he's in the wrong body. And he isn't. He's just a gay boy. The other area where it's, it, there's a conflict with uh, same-sex attraction uh, is with same-sex attraction is based on your, your sex, your biological sex. Mm -hmm. It's not based on your gender that you think you are. So a homosexual man is attracted to a, another man, like a biological man, not to somebody who identifies as a man. Mm -hmm. And the same, and it's the same for a lesbian. So there's a conflict there. And hence you've got this issue with lesbians who don't want to accept, you know, people are identifying as women. That, that's they have no interest, they have no attraction to a man who thinks he's a woman. And 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 hence there is a conflict, and hence we're seeing this divide happening between the LGB and the QT. And there's even a proposal, uh, LGB Alliance in the UK are trying to propose that LGBTQ is done away with that because they do not buy into LGBTQ anymore. They're LGB and they see QT as something different mm -hmm. and they don't want to be linked to them because there's a conflict there. There is an actual conflict. So that's going there, to be There's a conflict as well in the wording. So if you look at LGBT, B is bisexual, bi means two, and T means more yeah. than one sex. So the, even even the T and the B would be at, at, at heads because B is for, oh, for yeah. bisexual and T is, God, what are there, nine genders or 50 genders or whatever the newest thing is? Well, yeah, I mean, the bisexual kind of sits in the middle, I guess, in one sense. So a bisexual person uh, could be attracted to a trans woman as well as a trans man because if they're bisexual, then they're, you know, but uh, so this, that's kind of an interesting one. But the, the LGB does kind of go together. Mm -hmm. They do the three; those three kind of mm -hmm. go together. QT, queer is, is is queer is politics really. So and an ideology. It's different. Uh, it's different to sexual orientation. Against that's the key message. Um, so let's move on. So heteronormativity. We just need to talk about it because people mightn't be familiar what it is. Um, the term started to. Uh, become popular in the early 90s and i guess this is when queer theory was evolving so is if the term started evolving at the same time as queer theory naturally because queer theory is in a in opposition to heteronormativity um and so you know heteronormativity is is you know is is same sex is is opposite sex attraction i should say it's heteronormative it's people having families getting married uh, having you know what we would see as kind of normal sexual practices etc uh, these are all part of the, the the heteronormative world, if I call it that. Um, and so, you know, the, they would see this as a, a, a hierarchy. Uh, this is the patriarch, as it were. Uh, this is uh, oppressive. Uh, so people would find, you know, heteronormative constructs as being oppressive. They're oppressing people who are queer, uh, who are not heteronormative. Um, they go as far as saying that heteronormativity is an ideology. 
and even homonormativity, homonormativity which is, you know, homosexuals, uh, is a kind of an ideology as well. And you'll also hear the term uh, cis heteronormativity, as in cisgender heteronormativity. Um, so, you know, this heteronormative is an alignment with nature. It's an alignment with biology as we understand it. It's an alignment with what people would see as, as normal. And queer theory is fundamentally in opposition to this and we and wishes to break it down. And this whole notion of straight privilege, we've heard of white privilege. So the notion of straight privilege or heteronormative privilege uh, as an oppressive force um, that's that, that's been supported by societal norms that are oppressive to people who aren't heteronormative. So, um, so they so would feel the just to clarify to for, the, for this slide, Eugene, they would feel yeah. the the people who endorse the queer theory and the Marxism, they would think that me, born a female, and I am a woman, and I feel okay in my woman body. They would feel that that's oppressive. That's heteronormative. Yeah, well, if you, if you, if if well, if it is, yeah. Now, if you were, if you were queer and you were, uh, uh say bisexual and you, uh, you know, you you didn't mind certain sexual practices, well, then you'd be queer. You would have a queer consciousness then, and so you, you know, you could be, uh, you know, in and there are, as I said, there are queer parents. There are queer parents who are married with children, um, but but they have a queer mindset. They have a queer. They follow a queer politics. And and they believe in you know the, the various aspects of queer, uh, the ideology of, of of queerness. So, um, but yeah, you, you people would see this as oppressive. They see heteronormativity as oppressive. Um, it's terrible. It's uh, you know they they would see even childhood innocence. Childhood innocence is kind of seen as a form of oppression. It's seen as a threat. Um, you have to queer that, because childhood innocence is the opposite to queer. That's pretty horrendous now to think about that. So what does that mean in the context of a school? If you have a queer teacher, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, so these are, um, I'm going to, these next two charts, I went into chat GPT. So chat GPT is queer. It's Marxist, left-leaning. So I asked chat GPT to give me the objectives of queer theory. And it gave me 10 objectives. So I'm going to go through them here. Um, there's nothing nothing surprising here deconstruction of norms uh hard dynamics you know this is what michel foucault was looking into uh in terms of uh hard dynamics associated specifically with sexuality um fluidity we talked about gender fluidity uh you know and, and again the diversity of people's identity uh intersectionality where you bring in other aspects of of race etc um uh critique of heteronormativity okay so you can see it here uh, is to resist heteronormativity, seeks to challenge the privilege of heteronormative ideas in societal structures, right? So there we got it. And the promotion of inclusivity. So this whole world of inclusivity, we see this everywhere today, and we see it hugely in education. And inclusivity is the term used to bring queer theory into the classroom. So any for any parent, when you hear inclusivity in your school, when you hear a program talking about inclusivity, that actually means bringing in queer. They won't. No one will talk about queer theory. They won't mention queer theory. But what that will mean is the children will be taught about non-binary, about gender ideology, about transitioning, about not using heteronormative language, about you know using gender neutral language. That's what inclusivity means in education, and we've seen it. And, and it also means the same in institutions as well, of course. So we, we're familiar with diversity, equity, inclusion in institutions, and it means the same thing there as well. But very important to see this in education. And that doesn't matter what age the child is. So this is in, irrespective of whether the child is four or 10 or 17. They're going to bring in gender theory to the classroom, which is part of queer theory. So the next one, these are the last objectives, and and these are relevant. Actually, I, I've I've put up a, a familiar um, uh, character here, so who's representing us in the Eurovision Song Contest. For those who can recognize, recognize her under the the various makeup, etc. And this is very applicable to the items I'm talking about here. So affirmation of non-normative identities, 
um, disruption of normative discourses, you know, broaden the understanding of what is considered to be normal. So normalizing the abnormal, normalizing the perverse, etc. Uh, encouragement of activism. This is hugely important. Uh, so Bambi Thug uh, is an artist, but she's also a queer activist. She's using her position as an art uh, as an artist uh, to be an activist, and queer uh, queer theory calls you to activism. You have to be an ally. You have to be an activist for queer, but, and that's so. In indoctrinating children in school into queer theory, even if they're not using the term queer theory. They are ultimately going to indoctrinate those children into activism. And very often that can be Marxist activism. Careers for Palestine, BLM, you mentioned it. You know, we, we see this, this march that's happening. Yeah. Would this cover Eugene? You know how um, we did a campaign there last autumn with Belong to going into schools and doing their stand up weeks, getting the quality mark. I think there's 32 schools or more now signed up for this quality mark and they're, yeah. you know, recruiting uh, age 14 to 23 to join the trans movement. And they're going to be going down now. It's announced on their, I think on their website down to age 10 for belong to. So would belong to, would they be their trans right activists, but would they fall under the queer theory or is that a different activism? Yes. No, it's the same. Okay. It's the same. They're bringing queer into schools under the the notion of inclusion, under the notion of anti-bullying. Mm -hmm. These are typically the ways. So basically to get rid of bullying out of a school, you have to indoctrinate the children in the school in queer theory. That's essentially what's happening right now. And they want to bring in, obviously they want to get children to identify with queer identities, such as being trans, for example. Mm -hmm. And they also want to create allies within the school. Yes. So if they can't get a child to identify with a queer identity, uh, they want all their friends in the class to be allies for them. Mm -hmm. And yep. in that way, they can pretty well capture an entire class, basically. It can capture an entire school. Um, and from stats we've seen, Eugene, I know that up to, I think an article came out a year ago that said up to up to 90% of children who fell down the, you know, the, the transgender path in schools were children on the autistic spectrum. So they potentially could be getting the children that are autistic or maybe kids who are vulnerable or gay into this indoctrination. And then they create the rest of the class to be their allies, to stand up and stand with them and be inclusive. Yep. And if you're not inclusive and not standing as their allies, then you're not kind or you're a bully or whatever label they right. like to, to put right. on. So, okay, yeah, that's, right. that's their strategy. That makes sense. It, it is. Yeah, it is. It is very. And so they know then they can get, they've locked in that school mm -hmm. into this thing. And then obviously everything flows from there. Yep. So expir expiration of desire and pleasure. Again, we saw this from Gay Rubin and from Michel Foucault challenging the moral and cultural norms uh, surrounding sexuality. So, uh, you know, and again, this has been brought into classrooms in secondary school at the moment. Um, engagement with, with cultural production. So Bambi Thug, she's engaged with cultural production. She's an artist, a singer. She's going to be representing Ireland as a queer artist at the Eurovision Song Contest. So, and is that uh, her on the bottom uh, as well, painted like it, it Satan? Is, it is, it oh, is, goodness. yeah, yeah, that's her. <laughs> Lovely. So, uh, and again, the reason, so you know, we've seen it with Disney, for example. So, Disney have been introducing queer constructs, queer characters into cartoons, into movies, etc. Uh, they've been basically queering uh, the, the, the cultural production of their movie making, their TV making mm -hmm. etc so we see we see that as an example of that so let's look at this so to queer so queer is uh is also a verb so to queer uh it's defined as a verb and if you and i've got the kind of definitions coming from some of the uh, dictionaries here so to to um, consider something interpreted from a perspective that rejects traditional categories of gender and sexuality or in, ge in a more general sense it could be what is considered normal right that's you can apply that as well to make or modify something in a way that reflects one's rejection of gender and sexuality norms, and then to change something so that it does not relate uh, to, you know, the, the gender binary, no longer fits traditional ideas of sex and gender. So in, in the context of a school, the something here would be a child. And we kind of see an example of it there on the left. 
uh, changing their mind uh, through indoctrination and changing their body, um, you know, through transitioning or both. Usually and the, dra you know, the if, drag the drag queen, the, um, one, the mascots for the drag queen reading hours uh, or the reading hours are drag queens, and it We're boggles my mind how they've chosen a drag queen to be the mascot for ch child reading sessions. And the other question is, why don't those drag queens go to nursing homes? They're very targeting very much the yeah. young children yeah. at a library and seeing these kids there with a the drag queen dressed in that, you know, scantily dressed clothing. It is, it's, it's breaking down that normal uh, and, and it, sexualizing it, 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 of it children. Is. It is. We'll get to that actually. We've, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. So queer pedagogy. So this is bringing queerness into education. So uh, this is a, a, a document um, from 1993. So again, 1993 was when queer was being defined. You know, this is the time when heteronormativity, that definition of heteronormativity. Uh, so this is when it's kind of coming into, into vogue. So this this uh, this book here, this paper, Queer Pedagogy Praxis Makes I Am uh, Slash Perfect, uh, Canadian Journal of Education. So Canada, as we know, is quite a woke uh, society. Mm -hmm. So here they start talking about actively uh, querying pedagogy. And that means querying the schools, querying the curriculum in the schools. Uh, this seems a promising approach indeed for refreshing pedagogy. So we're going to, you know, we're going to refresh the curriculum as we've done in Ireland with SPHE and RSE. And basically we're going to queer it. And that's exactly what we've done with our, our curriculum in Ireland. Being no doubt that the new curriculum is fully queered. Uh, and this is just to give you an example. So let's roll forward uh, to 2021. So this is uh, talking about elementary education, um, a queer curriculum for fourth grade. So from the Journal of Critical Education Policy, um, they're talking about fourth graders beginning to have their own personal dictionaries to keep track of the terminology, cisgender, transgender, uh, the learning goals about understanding the differences between assigned sex and gender identity, talking about the pronouns, the, the gender binary. Uh, and then the students start reading this book about George, a trans, a trans kid, uh, and then using other children's books uh, and uh, brainstorming about uh, stereotypes with regard to sex and gender. This is what's in the Irish curriculum. We're not talking about the Irish curriculum today, but just to let people know, this is already there in the junior cycle. These books are already being used. These books are in libraries. They're being used in classrooms. And they're being used when parents don't even realize it. That well, might be another motivation, Eugene, yeah. for the school uh, purchasing the books. Parents don't have to purchase books anymore. Some of these books don't need to come home in the backpack. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So we'll get, we're going to go, go more. So this is again, um, queer pedagogy going a bit more. So it sees heteronormativity as an oppressive construct. So uh, they'll advocate uh, to basically everything uh, that is heteronormative is a source of oppression. So queer academics, queer educators, activists, teachers, they'll want to bring in queer identities, queer sexuality, queer politics into every aspect of the curriculum, not just the SPHE, they want to get into this whole school approach is the term they use. Holistic so is another buzzword. We, we, we've heard the word yeah, holistic. holistic. That's yeah. another uh, another holistic. red flag yeah, of a that's word. That's the term. Yeah, 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 exactly. And you'll hear the term critical being used. They might say critical thinking or critical education. Critical theory is actually what's at the bottom of that. Critical theory, critical theory is Marxism. Um. So critical pedagogy wants to do this. It wants to queer all elements that are described as heteronormative. Uh, the male and female gender binary, masculinity, the nature of masculinity and femi femininity, they have to be queered. The union of m man and woman in, in marriage. Any historical view of the family, does that resonate with what we're voting on in the next few days? Yeah, removing uh, woman, childhood. removing removing woman, removing mother, removing home and uh, yeah. adding in durable relationship it absolutely is is all about the the referendum taking place on friday it's trying yeah. to trying to put that all of this into our constitution in ireland yeah 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 so heteronormative language i think i've heard that term used by norma foley um uh, established views of normal sexual practices 
So in schools today, you'll learn about anal sex, you'll learn about fisting, you'll learn about all sorts of things in the SPHE for the junior cycle, right? Uh, the human body, again, queering the body. And trans is basically a, a, a mechanism of queering the body. And they ba basically want to get rid of every structure as well that supports heteronormativity. And this is basically the church religion or, or is a structure that supports heteronormativity. Uh, and, and, you know, they would not be in line with that. So here, here, this is what you were talking about earlier on. Um, uh, you know, so uh, I, what I'm going to quote, we'll have a link to this in the description. So we'll put the link to this paper. So there's an academic paper uh, produced by Harper Keenan, who was a trans person, and Little Miss Hot Mess, who's a drag queen. Uh, they published this paper just a couple of years ago, and they kind of talk about the whole notion of drag queen story hour and drag pedagogy, which is essentially queer pedagogy. It's just using drag queens uh as a form. And, you know, they talk about, uh, you know, it, it, it's essentially to destabilize children. It's to muddy the kind of the notion of their identity, uh, you know, trying to bring the notion of queer identities, you know, destabilize them. Um, and particularly if you do this at a young age, at the very early ages, which is, you know, four, five, six, the ages when children are just coming to terms with being a boy, being a girl, you want to disturb that. Because you don't want them to be following the normative path. Uh, you want to disturb the normal development of those children so that they now look at perhaps adopting a queer identity, a fluid identity. Uh, so that's what this thing is all about. Um, you know, the, the, the paper is, you can read it, the paper, they have it in black and white in the paper, they talk about it. You can see here, building in part from queer theory and trans studies, queer and trans pedagogies seek to actively destabilize the normative function of schooling through transformative education. Okay, so this is what it's all about. This is not innocent. There's a motivation behind it. Parents need to be aware of that. And uh, it is totally inappropriate. I mean, look at the statements even lower down there. Childhood innocence is targeted by blurring the boundaries between children and adults through the inappropriate sexualization of young children. Uh, they ultimately want them to dissociate from their sex bodies, acquire a queer identity. And again, there's a quote down there. Artists have channeled their penchant for playfully reading each other to filth um, into different forms of literacy, promoting storytelling as integral to queer and trans communities, as well as positioning queer and trans cultural forms as valuable components of early childhood education. So it's there in black and white. People should download the paper. We'll have the link. Uh, you, you can take it down and read it yourself. And this is happening on Irish so, soil because when um, the when the drag queen reading hours first started, I saw on Instagram they were advertising a drag queen story hour in South Dublin for age four plus. So I thought little four year olds sitting there with these drag queens dressed filthy, reading filthy books or whatever. I thought, how can any mother think that that's okay for age four? It's beyond me, but it's all done under that kindness and inclusion. And isn't this fun and lovely and all the rainbows, but it, it's really dangerous material. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, there's a motivation behind it. It is a movement actually. Mm -hmm. So pushing the limits. So queer educators, um, they would like to see certain, they, they don't like some of the restrictions that are on them at the moment. Um, so con concerns over child safeguarding, they wish to uh, get around any safeguarding concerns. They want them waived. And right now, in Irish schools, educators, teachers are allowed to have a secrecy pact with the children. We've confirmed this with the teacher training organization, EJA. And they've come back and said, oh, this is necessary that we have this so we can properly you know, go through the various exercises they need, the kind of privacy and secrecy. So right now, they're telling children not to tell anything at home in terms of what's going on in the classroom. And belong to, if I can jump in, Eugene, belong to, there was a document we, we produced during our campaign that belong to was asking teachers to lie to parents about their children. And that was in the written document uh, with belong to minister for children. Roderick O'Gorman was questioned on it, but of course he said, oh, I haven't seen that, even though his department funds much of this, but teachers are being asked to lie to parents. That makes me as a mother very, very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a huge issue. I think uh, having secrecy in a classroom situation like this is just, it's, it is outrageous. Mm. So this, we're going to need to, there's going to need to be more on this. The whole notion of childhood innocence, to somebody who is queer, 
the notion of childhood innocence, they, they can't have it. They've got to queer that child. It's as simple as that. It's they, they can't have a child. This notion of childhood innocence is, is oppressive to them. It's a threat uh, to them. And, you know, they want to get around it. They can't, they can't have it. The age level of exposure, as young as possible, starting at three, age of three, if possible. Uh, religious ethos, they want to subvert that totally. They can't have any opt-outs or anything like this. They want to get around any sort of moral or religious ethos. And they want to get around any control that parents have. So they want to remove any visibility parents have to the curriculum. And they want to have removed any options for opt-outs. They want to mandate, and hence they're doing the whole school holistic approach. So the only way you can opt out is by homeschooling, basically. Um, so queer educators, they see it as their mission to free children from the normative oppression of their parents and help to bring them to a queer consciousness. That's that's what it's about. So parents be warned. So that's kind of, we're kind of getting towards the end here. So, um, so queer activists, they all talk about an inclusive society, the removal of outdated societal norms. Um, but the, the means to achieve this is the indoctrination of children through education. That's it. Inclusion and diversity is the language that they use. They use it with governments. They use it with agencies to infiltrate those agencies, to get into those agencies. It's the Trojan horse to bring queer theory and radical gender theory into the classroom and also into academia, into other institutions, into corporate offices, etc. And we see this all around us. This is a language, you know, be kind, be kind. Um, queer theory is just what it says. It's a philosophical theory. We talked about it earlier. Those people are philosophers. They're sociologists. They're sexologists. They're not they're not science scientists. They don't engage in scientific research. They don't engage in factual research. They engage in theories, ideas, ideologies, philosophies. And that's what queer theory is. And let's it's not forget a few theory. slides back, uh, a few slides back, Eugene. Yeah. I can't remember which were the two people, but they believe that uh, it's okay to have boy lover, boy lovers and sex with minors. So uh, let's call yeah. that what it is. This is also a, uh, a, a pedophile playbook and and I, I unapologetically will say that because that's no other word for for sex with minors than that yep yeah and that ultimately that's where it will go to it's not it's they it's not deemed acceptable right now but that's where it's heading um so this philosophical theory of humanity as seen through a queer lens so a queer lens basically means you've got to take down anything that's not anything that's normative or normalcy is bad everything that's against normalcy is good um it's not based on science or objective truth. They don't believe in science. They don't believe in objective truth. How convenient. How convenient. We don't believe in the truth or we don't believe in, in science. So this is our theory. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a belief system. It's effectively a religion, a Gnostic religion or a cult. And, that, and it should be treated as such. It should not be treated as fact. Because right now it's been taught as fact, as if it was science, as if it was reality, as if, as if it was the truth. And that's, that's the problem. And it's been taught to children as such. Like, I've no issue that adults can choose identities and sexual practices, as I say, between consulting adults. That's not a problem. Any libertarian will support that and won't have an issue with that. They mightn't like it or agree with it, but they, you know, adults are adults and they can do what they will. But what's happening here is they're bringing this into the classroom and attempting to indoctrinate children. And that's the fundamental issue here. There are so certain things, Eugene, that, uh, in yeah. certain things I'll say, like uh, as a mother, there are certain things that absolutely are appropriate or OK for adults to engage in these different, you know, beliefs, fetishes, uh, drag queens, what whatever they want to do, or even things like getting a tattoo. My children can't yet get a tattoo or drive a car or vote or drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes. But when they're over 18, those choices are theirs to make. So why is this being allowed in front of children when they're not even old enough to drive a car yet? It just, it's beyond belief. Yeah, well, it's been framed under a, a human rights framework. Uh, so this is and a, a kind of inclusivity, diversity framework. So this is, you'll see quotations of United Nations human rights. And we'll talk about, we'll get into the United Nations and WHO in another session. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's what they'll say to you. Well, this is the United Nations. Uh, this is a human right. These children uh need to get educated in this as part of their rights and and then we need to have an inclusive classroom we need to have an inclusive school 
mm-hmm. an inclusive community. Um, yeah, I was at that, I was that, at a debate. Uh, I was at a debate yesterday, watching a debate with them regarding the referendum, and there was a Labour Party leader, Ivana, uh, debating with the Senator Michael McDowell. And I think that Ivana must have said diversity and inclusivity or inclusion at least 15 times during her talk. So that's in the minds of all the political parties. You keep hearing diversity, inclusion, and and the more people hear it, it's in their mind. They think it really is about being, you know, who wouldn't want to be included? Who wouldn't want to celebrate, you know, people being different? But this has a whole different meaning of the word inclusion and diversity. It's it's hijacked the true meaning of the words. It, it, it has. And that's what those guys we looked at, the Frankfurt School, they had psychologists working in the Frankfurt School. And that part of their psychology was to figure out what language to use to be able to infiltrate organizations, to basically trick and fool people, uh, you know, to believe in something. And they actually, the words mean something totally different. And diversity, equity, inclusion do mean something very different. Uh, and things like critical race theory were deliberately introduced to disrupt societies, deliberately. Mm-hmm. Like that's their objective. This is not about being inclusive or anything like that. Or, or, but unfortunately, they've they've won people over. They've, they've, you know, they've they've, uh, they've got into institutions based on this, and they're in place right now. And the trouble is, in schools in particular, this is really harmful. Uh, and this this notion of redefining human anthropology, as I say here, ignoring science, ignoring medicine, ignoring human evolution, the order of creation. We wouldn't exist if queer theory, uh, if everybody was queer uh, in our ancestors, we wouldn't be here because basically humanity would have died out long ago. <laughs> you know, that's the reality. Um, so this thing is basically seeking to take down the current society we have, you know, no- normalize deviant and, sur- and perverse sexual practices. Again, if again, if it's adults, you know, that's that's maybe fine, but don't bring it into the classroom for children. That's mm-hmm. that's the issue. Um, and this relative m- morality, that there is no objective truth, there is no objective morality. And if you bring that into a religious context, you know, as a Catholic, that's basically saying there's no sin. There's no truth and there's no sin. And ultimately, if you're a Marxist, there is no God. So uh, is a parent going to be happy with that? Is that, is that a way to live? Um, I'm afraid that's a real problem. Um, so queer theory, you know, they talk about it being inclusive, but actually it's dangerous to all children, including LGBTQ children. This thing is dangerous to all children. No children should be exposed to this. It destabilizes them. It, it radicalizes them, ultimately compromises their future, some of them to a huge degree, unfortunately. Uh, and it, and for, it affects every child. So even the most confident child is going to be hurt by this in school um it's deadly it really is so that brings me to we're near the end this is the last slide um this is a book i'm recommending to people the querying of the american child um by logan lansing and and james james lindsay logan lansing is the primary author i'm just going to use this this last paragraph here uh which is his definition around queer theory built Queer theory is built on the classical Marxist model of society being split between the dominant oppressor class of those who see themselves as normal and the oppressed class of those who see themselves abnormal or queer. It's incumbent upon the oppressed class to become conscious of the truth of queer theory, to develop a queer consciousness, which is what they're trying to do to children in school, get them to develop this queer consciousness, and to become revolutionaries charged with taking control of society and deconstructing normalcy. So that's an alternative definition of queer, queer theory. Highly recommend any parent to get this book and read it cover to cover and probably read it twice. Because if you're not familiar with the subject matter, you'll probably need it to read it twice to fully get it. It's an easy book to read. It talks about queer theory. It talks about most of what we've talked about on this, but it also t- goes into how queer theory is manifest in the classroom how the lessons in the classroom, uh, you know, bring in queer theory, the mechanisms they use, uh, the Ferrarian ped- pedagogy as well. And we'll talk about that in another session from Paulo Ferrer, his mechanisms for social emotional learning, bringing in generative themes into the classroom, getting the children to actually interact and talk and, and suggest about what we discuss. 
these are all used to actually bring queer theory into the classroom now. That's what's happening. They're, some of these things are actually quite good techniques for education, but they're now being used to bring in this, unfortunately. Um, so that's that's kind of it. It's, uh, uh, you know, we, we'll do other sessions on other stuff, but that's kind of an introduction to queer theory. Uh, we'll have a lot of references in the description so people can check them out. And as I said, this is a, I, I would, if you're a parent, I think you have to buy this book and you have to read this book because that will enlighten you even, even more than this session. This session will hopefully have set a few alarm bells for you. Uh, but reading the book will then kind of solidify that a little bit more. It's, it's currently, well uh, it must be a popular book since it just, uh, it recently came out. Is that right? It just came out. Uh, and it's sold out Thursday. already on, I think on Amazon, it's sold out. I'm not sure where stock it, but what we can do is order a few. I think it's probably worth, um, you know, maybe I suppose it's what can we do? So we've just heard tonight about where this is coming from, how deep it is, yeah. how, how historical it is. This is not a grassroots kindness movement that's coming from the bottom up. This is a political movement being pushed on children. So it's it's sort of daunting for for parents. Parents can feel helpless, and it would be really good to maybe do some live events, inviting teachers, inviting principals, inviting boards of management, uh, involving you know patrons of the school. I know we have been writing letters to bishops, and you know maybe we need to keep keep up with that to try to get people to see really the danger before it really unravels and becomes out of control. So is there anything, Eugene, that you would suggest that we can do as parents or that, you know, I know we have a few hundred teachers in our network yeah. through the Irish yeah. Education Alliance. What what can we do? I, I think the first thing to do is educate yourself. And I mean, I, I've spent, you know, best part of three years now probably trying to square the circle, as it were. And it only came together for me probably a, a number of months ago when I found out about the whole Frankfurt School and that connection of critical theory and how that carried, because that gives you the genealogy of where this came from. It came from Marxism, basically, and mm -hmm. it's ultimately a Marxist theory. Um, and this is political. And hence, you've got people go who go to LGBTQ trans parades with Marxist flags who are just Marxists, right? They're just purely there on the from a political agenda perspective. Uh, so I never appreciated that before. I never realized that was the case. I never I hadn't made that connection. But the whole aspect of the school, so educate yourself. This book is the best book I've seen. This would save you reading about 20 other books on the topic. And it's an easy read. Well, it's an easy read in one sense. The English is easy to follow. It's not an easy read in terms of the subject matter because it's gonna be it does get a bit disturbing. Mm -hmm. But educate yourself is the first thing. Educate your immediate people that you know, other parents, other teachers, who perhaps they're they're some of them will be bought into this. So some of them will be Marxists, some of them will be queer, some of them will be transing their children and be fully on board with doing that. But then an awful lot of people aren't. An awful lot of people are just there. They want to do the right thing. They want to be kind. They don't want to be bigoted. They don't want to be seen as being bigoted. And those people are the people that you need to talk to and you need to encourage them to educate themselves and perhaps buy this book as a present. It's sold out on Amazon UK. I think you can might get the hard copy. You'll certainly get the Kindle version is still, is still available. If you go to Amazon in Germany, Amazon DE or Amazon Italy or Amazon France, you'll get it there. It's available. I've checked it. So d don't just stay with Amazon UK. If you're in, in uh, if you're in Ireland, check out the, uh, you'll probably have to pay a bit of extra postage, but it's well worth it. Uh, this is the future of your child you're talking about here. So the investment in this book is a small investment. It's 240 pages to read it. It's not a huge investment in time either, but it'll open your eyes. And then the question is, where do we go from here? And we will come back to that in a session when we talk about Irish education explicitly. So I think, you know, we will come back to that. But the first thing is educate yourself and then also make people aware in your circle at least talk to them. Some of them may not be willing to come around yet. Some of them, we need to get past, oh, I've got a gay uncle. I, I've got a, I've got gay friends uh, who are, LG, you know, in the LGBTQ movement. You have to get past that. This isn't, this isn't good for them. <laughs> this isn't good for them either. You're not betraying them by uh, questioning this. Um, uh, queer theory, as we saw, contradicts same-sex same -sex attraction. It's in opposition to it. They're, they are trans and gay kids 
And I know that some gay people who are more enlightened, who are awake, if we want to call use the term awake rather than woke, they understand this now. And there's movements in Ireland, there's gay movements in Ireland that are calling out belong to uh, because they see what they're doing. Um, if anyone wants to go on the uh, on the Twitter account, there's an I was on a Twitter space call for a couple hours the other night as a guest. It was hosted by uh, Not All Gays and they have a Twitter account and I've tweeted the Twitter space and a lovely lady who who is a lesbian told her story of when she did attend Belong To and the really terrifying facts around Belong To. They're clearly they do make the youth feel that they're born in the wrong body. Things like teaching them how to use chest binders and wash chest binders behind their parents' back. And that's a very damaging thing to, for a young girl to wear. So that's a really good account to follow. There's gays against groomers. There's lots, loads and loads of people, you know, our gay friends and, and, and family members and neighbors that are completely against this as well. So it's just to be clear, don't confuse queer theory with homosexual, two totally different things. We, you know, this is queer theory in, in essence is actually homophobic. And, you know, the, these the, it's blurs the two. I think the words confuse people, but that's really great, Eugene, that you clarify that queer queer is very different to to homosexual, gay, lesbian community. Yeah. Yeah. So so I'd encourage people to, you know, we'll put a lot of good links in the description here. So people, please check those out. There'll be websites, there'll be links to videos, there'll be references to some of these books definitely check them out because educating yourself is the first step on the process here. Uh, and we will have a separate session talking about Irish education and what, you know, some of the other things you do, particularly in the context of engaging with your school, with the principals and all that. We'll cover that in another session. Okay. That's great. Thanks so much for the information. It's a lot to digest and uh, we'll make sure we do maybe a follow-up and maybe we could, once I read the book, Eugene, I know you've read it, we could maybe do, uh, a 30 minute session on just talking about the book and maybe reading from some pages and just doing a kind of a, a, a book promotion, so to say. So thank you so much for the information. <laughs> it really is. Uh, it's peeling back the the layers of a very, very uh, a, a deep, the deep, dark onion, peeling back the, the onion layer by layer by labor, labor and layer. And I know that you've done you know, years of research on this and you've read loads of books and, and studies. So it really helps to you know, even though this discussion is probably about an hour and a half, it's based on hundreds of hours of your research and reading. So it packages it up really nicely so we can all understand where it's coming from. So thanks so much for that. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Great. Stop recording now. <laughs>